today, I just we just wanted to conclude and kind of bring it back together. Uh, Kustub just focused on snow leopards and it's uh, bringing back again to what we've already kind of covered, but giving it a little bit of a twist and looking more again at this landscape scale that Kustub has just introduced this morning, um, because we wanted to make sure that you guys walked away with not thinking that occupancy surveys were only used for the species eight. And we wanted to make sure that you saw how it could be relevant for real life species like elusive snow leopards, wolves, lynx, or other uh, ungulates as well um, throughout the snow leopard range or beyond. Um, so the main messages from our previous training sessions remain, the importance of accounting for detection, key design issues of replication, and using covariates for, to model variations in occupancy and detection. Um, but we wanted uh, to give attention to this kind of large scale assessments that can be used. And I think Kostu provided a really nice introduction um, to that. And there's this great example of how occupancy was used at landscape level called by Tubman and all 2016. We sent around this paper and Kustub mentioned this paper uh, this morning. Uh, so for those that have not read this paper, we really encourage it as an introduction about using occupancy at the landscape level for snow leopards. So the team was really interested in assessing the status of snow leopards and other carnivores across the curious alley. And this is the kind of the study area. So they divided their study area of 14,000 kilometers squared into 49 grid cells. So each grid cell, as you can see here, is around 400 kilometers squared. So let's step back a bit for a moment and consider that this was our study area. And we wanted to collect data on snow leopards presence across this entire study area of 49 grids. So I'm going to ask you a few questions and I would really appreciate if everyone wrote in the chat what their thought what their thoughts are, what how they would plan or approach um, this study. There is no one way. There are many options. So please be aware of that. So this is the first question I would like to ask everyone. How could we go about to detect snow leopards and verify species uh, identification in this study area? So please write in the chat, how would you go by and collect snow leopard presence and absence data? We'll look at the chat. Kustub, you can also replan the study because you were involved in planning the initial study. <laughs> Rob uh, Nawaz said I would start by setting up camera traps in each grid cell. Okay, so camera traps to detect snow leopards. Um, Ranjana says she would use science surveys or interviews or camera trap. Okay, Ranjana, you're going to do all three. You're going to do mixed methods. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, Hakik uh, would like to do science surveys for, and scats and camera traps. Okay. Maybe try first with questionnaires, Ursa is suggesting. Okay, Chloe is saying scats, scratches, trail cameras, herder surveys, camera traps, genetics or uh, sampling. So these are all great uh, suggestions. Um, I see more coming in. Uh, and uh, Mustafar is suggesting since it's such a large area, interviews would be a good step. Um, and Helena is highlighting Potentially, we should start with a pilot study with interviews um, before we go out to this huge area and set up camera traps. And that, that's a great idea. Um, maybe we should go step by step um, and go slowly because it is a huge area. Each grid cell is 400 kilometers squared. But having said that, all of these options are potential. There is also mixed methods. We haven't talked too much about that, but there are mixed method occupancy approaches. So you could use camera traps in a number of cells. You could use science surveys in a number of other cells, and you could analyze the data together. That is possible because you can assume different detection probabilities for different survey techniques. 
Um, but I think the Musafar has one and he said he would like to use drones, <laughs> which I think is what Kustub would have planned the second round too. So next question, just to bring back the home, uh, the idea of replicates, what would be your replicates depending on what you decided to do? So you can say again, if I use camera trapping, I would use, what would my replicate be? Uh, blah, blah, blah. So if you could, uh, everyone again, write in the chat, what they would consider their replicates because it would differ depending on the method you recommended. And Kustub, you can again join in and replan your survey. Actually, that's a very good question we can ask you afterwards, Kustub, what you would have done differently. Okay, Rob is writing that replicates would be the number of weeks of the deployed cameras. Okay, so a number of weeks. So you could have one week as a replicate um, and have leave the cameras for a few months and have each week. Yeah, um, I've seen often it's five to seven days often creates a nice uh, enough detections and non-detection uh, data for occupancy. But of course it depends on, your, uh, on the species itself and how often you detect it. I did, Kustub says I'd have first checked how much money we have. Yes, very good point. <laughs> In reality, you would be restrained by your money. Um, Chauncey is su suggesting sign surveys could be multi-section uh, for, for viewing. Okay, so you could divide your sign transect into different sections. Um, and that could you be your replicates? Yeah, that is a very uh, nice idea that was used in tigers in, uh, in, in uh, India and also what uh, was used in Mongolia. And there is a Heinz and all um, model that can account for the, uh, the detection between different transects being linked. Letro is saying temporal replicates for camera traps, the number of days. Yes, great. Ursa is saying that for questionnaires, it could be the each person um, that you interview in, in a cell. Yes, and remember that if you interview a person in one cell, potentially they could be replicates for multiple cells because they have, might have knowledge for uh, information uh, wider than just the cell where they are. So that's a, that's a great point. Um, the protocol Chouette used in 20, uh, 2015. Chloe, please tell us what this protocol was um, because I'm not so familiar with it. And uh, Chauncey is uh, highlighting that he would use 100 meter replicates. Very nice. Um, Letro is saying that it could be spatial replicates and sign surveys. Yes, um, that's, that's good. And Musafar says temporal, a minimum of three. Um, so can you explain what you mean by that, Mutsafar? And okay, so Chloe is explaining more that she, um, he divided the grid cells and left camera traps a certain amount of time, then switched. Each grid had multiple times the camera traps. He did spatial and temperature replicates. Very nice, Chloe. So it's a kind of a mix of, of switching areas. Uh, that's a nice... Uh, nice way to then use camera traps and cover larger areas within your grid cells. Great, so these are all uh, great examples. Um, so then let's go to the next question. Um, what are your hypotheses on what could affect detection? So we're looking here at snow leopards across uh, this area in Kyrgyzstan. We know snow leopards are there. Um, depending on what method you decided to use, there will be different uh, covariates that will affect your detection. Um, so please uh, identify what they might be. Remember, as uh, Kustub uh, has highlighted in previous analysis session, we don't want to go overboard. We don't want to go fishing um, for our, our hypotheses after we've collected the data. So it's better to come prepared with some hypotheses so we actually collect data on detection. So please go ahead and write in the chat what your, uh, how, yes, so Rob says season. Okay, so maybe a season within 
your study. Remember, we want it to be closed. So we want, don't want to be conducting the survey over too long a period if we're doing single season occupancy modeling. Um, so maybe within that time period, you could uh, suspect that maybe weather would change it, Rob, maybe, or feel free to expand on that. Um, Sherry is suggesting topography. So you think, okay, topography could affect detection. Um, very true if you're doing sign surveys. Um, experience of surveyor, Hakik is suggesting if you're doing questionnaire surveys, a very good idea. Um, and experience, again, Ranjana has highlighted profession uh, might influence this, yes. Uh, whether someone has good knowledge about snow leopard signs or not may influence detection. Um, Chloe is uh, suggesting weather and landscape, which I assume is related to camera trapping or sign surveys. Okay, so nice, a, a nice uh, set and habitat, which Hakik, I assume, is related to sign surveys. So I guess the, the point we wanted to highlight here again is how the how detection affects uh, snow leopards will very much uh, depend on what survey method you use. So it's really important to go back to look at your survey method and then decide because something like habitat may be less a suitable uh, covariate for questionnaire surveys, for example, while it might be a very nice covariate for detection for uh, sign surveys and camera traps because we're, it very much depends on the method in collecting your data. Um, Yes, so then what could affect occupancy? So this might not vary so much depending on what method you put into place to collect your data. Um, so any ideas on what might affect snow leopard occupancy in this landscape? I don't know if Kustub, if you are there, maybe you can add on your knowledge of the area. Absolutely, I love, okay, sorry, I'm <laughs> laughing with Muzaffar's comment. <laughs> <laughs> He's saying, Muzaffar just said, make sure interview is not high, high on weeds. <laughs> okay, very, yes. very good point. <laughs> yeah, you don't want, uh, you want uh, your interview to be uh, sane and, and very present. <laughs> and it's, it's funny, this person detected every possible animal known, known to him in my study area. So yeah, <laughs> the kangaroos must have invaded uh, Himalayas. <laughs> Okay, very good point. Sorry. No worries. Uh, Kustub, do you know this area well um, on terms of the habitat? I wouldn't say very well. Uh, truly, my only experience has been uh, working on this paper uh, with Julia. But but yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting habitat because it it's uh, it connects the Tian Shan Mountains with the Pamirs, mm -hmm. right? And Pamirs are known to have uh, a very high snow leopard conducive habitats. Uh, Tian Shan as well has a very good habitat. And, and this particular area has a lot of people. Mm. Uh, so, so it was interesting and, uh, and uh, yeah, to, to, to start seeing patterns that affected uh, snow leopard uh, presence, uh, it, it was interesting. And, and one interesting uh, parameter we started detecting towards the end of the analysis was a a potential relationship between snow leopards and lynx, whereas mm -hmm. snow leopards were going down and lynx were coming up. So, you know, almost felt like it was meso predator release. It wasn't a very strong data um, uh, data point, but but still, yeah. So, um, no, these are great points. And I think people have picked up on that. Uh, Rob is saying human disturbance. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. which I think there we go. Yeah. highlighted was an issue, potentially mining, right? Mining, herding of livestock, um, settlements. Are these all possibilities, Kustu? I don't know the area very well, but I assume they are. Presence of prey, Chloe is saying, density mm -hmm. of prey. Yes, we know with carnivores that often is very important, but often, actually, that's a good point. Um, I Kustu might want to comment as well, but I found it's very hard to get reliable uh, estimates uh, for prey, uh, prey if you don't, if you're not getting data itself as well during your survey. So if you plan to look at prey, it's important to plan for it uh, because you could do an occupancy, uh, occupancy kind of survey at the same time for prey and use that as as your covariate or or, or look at species interaction. Um, so Absolutely. that's 
Nice. Absolutely. That's such a good point, Justine. In fact, <clears throat> the uh, I, I think we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but it's a very critical issue that often or we always say that prey is a very important element for snow leopards, but the very information about prey is never complete. Mm -hmm. And and to assume that wherever you have seen prey, it has prey and wherever you haven't seen prey does not have prey has the same risk as the occupancy of the snow leopard itself. So what you just suggested, I think that's a very important point to keep in mind and and uh, and test uh, in in a study. Otherwise, mo what most people suggest uh, is uh, is to use surrogates for what could be affecting prey. What could be the factors that could be def defining prey distribution? And if there are some spatial layers that can be used as a as a proxy for prey distribution, uh, many times they they serve fairly reasonable purpose uh, as well. Yeah, good point. So these are great, um, great suggestions, even Chloe suggesting presence of competitors uh, and also uh, connectivity of habitat patches. So these are great and oops, and if you do have uh, hypotheses, it's good to think about them beforehand and then plan. Um, and then the final question that I haven't added to this slide, but it's important to think about is how do you sample in a way that's representative and thinking back to sampling itself? And I think Ian will go back to this so um, and bring back the ideas of sampling. So we won't go into it too much right now, but just to, uh, remembering that if you're doing sign surveys, not to just do the sign surveys in the bottom hand corner. Like think about how this sign survey can be representative of your whole area. Similarly with camera traps, if you have a camera trap at the far left corner, doesn't mean it represents the whole uh, grid cell or maybe it doesn't, but you can look at that later, but it's important to think about initially. So great, these are great ideas. So now I'll just share a little bit uh, quickly before we go to Ian on what they did do in reality. Um, so they hypothesized that the detection of the species would vary across interviewees. And they decided to use um, a person as the um, reporting snow leopard detections in their area of knowledge and a person's profession, time spent in the field and experience. They also hypothesized that occupancy would vary across time. So uh, between now 2010, which was at the time and previous period, which was during the Soviet Union. And why this period was chosen was it was a nice time in the past, but I remember Kustub explaining as well that it was a period that people would remember. Um, it was the last year of the Soviet Union. So people, it would be kind of in people's memory. So they would be able to recognize, okay, during this period, I potentially saw this many snow leopards. Um, so uh, just uh, going over, these were the kind of hypotheses they had, um, and they looked and interviewed 95 key informants from local communities over the study. And these 95 key informants provided information about multiple uh, grid cells. And uh, the study considered hunting or direct sightings or clearly identified signs to be species detections from the different interviewees. And each interviewee was the replicate, as I just explained. Um, and um, they obtained over 1,500 records of the species occurrence in uh, around the Soviet Union, which is a lot of data for, of multiple species, I must say. Uh, Precise and around a thousand from 2010. And this included snow leopards, ibex, Marco Polo, wolf, brown bear, and lynx. Um, and you know, they, they were able to get these two time periods, therefore, because they asked about 1990 and now. So this comes to a different model that we haven't touched too much upon, and hopefully maybe one day we can go into deeper uh, into these other models about occupancy, but they use multi-season occupancy models. So what is multi-season occupancy? models, just giving you a kind of just a little snapshot. We're not going to go into it too much. Um, but in, during the course, we talked about single season occupancy models that really gives a snapshot of the population over a single point in time. But sometimes we want to look at how this might change over time and also understand the population dynamics that causes this change. Right? And this can be done using uh, multi-season occupancy models. And there are different 
forms of this model. There's explicit multi-season models, implicit uh, multi-season models. So it's important to look at those assumptions for each of those models. But generally, um, they consider a new set of parameters. So you're also looking at extinction, which is here, uh, local colonization um, and probability between the different uh, seasons. And when looking over time, it's important again to take into account detection because detection may vary across the different time periods, which obviously will influence and bias your estimates. Um, so the, it's important to again, account for detection probability and initial occupancy. So this just to quickly show you the results from their study. Um, this was the historical distribution that they were able to get, which is Psi 1 um, during the 1990s. And then this was Psi 2. So they were able to use Psi 1 to then calculate Psi 2. And it looked at distribution of snow leopards in 2010. And which is really nice uh, the depiction is also the probability of a local extinction, um, which was looking at whether a site was used in 1990 and then no longer used in 2010. And I think, which is really nice uh, kind of results, again, you can see this is where the two parameters come in. You can actually put in covariates into these two parameters to look what might drive this extinction. And what's, this is a nice example of how they looked at slope influence detection and flatter areas were found to lead to more extinction. Is that right, Kustu? You could uh, share, yeah. Uh, so, so actually, it's the uh, is the other oh. way around. Uh, uh, the other way around. That's how yeah, I so, get to check. Yeah. So <laughs> areas which were flatter were ha more likely to have undergone local extinction. Yes. And there was no colonization whatsoever, which is why gamma remained constant. So there was no pattern in in colonization, but uh, local extinctions were sort of correlated with uh, with slope negatively correlated with slope. Yes. So flatter areas were more likely to have local extinction, which might be linked to other causes. Um, in the Absolutely. And this is what, what uh, where we talk about that uh, proxies, right, Justine? Uh, you know, uh, proxy parameters, something else indicating uh, uh, a response. So. Perfect. And this is what Kustu just mentioned, the lynx and the snow leopard. I think this is a great example, this study, because they tested more than just looking at the snapshot on what snow leopard presence over that one time period. They looked at multiple time period, but they also looked at different species. And the two species seem to mirror each other with, uh, with lynx occupancy being higher in areas snow leopards were not, uh, were not probably occurring. Um, and therefore, they also looked at the co-occurrence of both species. But when you look at co-occurrence, it adds a number of additional parameters. And just this is just to recognize that you need a lot of data to look at these kind of uh, interactions. So that's just something to note if you do plan to do that. As soon as you look at more complicated models, often there are many more parameters, which makes it difficult to use covariates, again, because then that adds on um, more to, to your model. Any uh, comment on this, Kusu? Great, so then the last slide is just to show, this is exactly what the Mongolia team did, uh, bringing back to the first presentation we did. Um, and you can see that the, the teams walked throughout their grid cells and they divided their grid cells into their assigned surveys into replicates. So there were different um, uh, replicates within their science surveys that were, were used. Um, so as you can see, um, I think as a take home message then it's just uh, occupancy is really powerful at the landscape level. It's often very cost effective because it depends on a species detection level instead of camera traps, which really, uh, if you're looking at SCR or individual identification, so it can be very cost effective. And also there are many advances in applications that are really interesting. So I encourage you to look into those more. I think Kustu might explain a little bit more at the end of class if we have time. And just to remember, remember your objectives. What are you trying to do? Is it just distribution in one time a slot? Is it covariance? Is it co-occurrence? And just to be very clear about those because that will lead to different assumptions 
um, but recognizing that some violations are okay if you're okay with it. And then uh, thinking about survey uh, designs. Um, so just to, now let's go over to Ian and Ian will share more about how occupancy can also be a really nice tool for stratification of uh, setting up our camera trap survey locations for pause. 